The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Our first presentation is going to be by uh, Majid Baradaran Sharaka. He's a, a postdoctoral student at uh, University of British Columbia. He's going to talk on the collapse assessment of non-ductile uh, retrofitted and ductile reinforced concrete buildings. Thank you, Dr. Elwood. Um, so this work has been done by Dr. Elwood, Dr. Yang, and myself from University of British Columbia, and Dr. Abby Lale from University of Colorado. And as Dr. Old mentioned, the title is about the collapse assessments of these existing buildings and when we retrofit one and how they compare with the new ductile building. So let me start with a little bit background and motivation. Uh, I had the luxury of being the part three, so I don't have to go through the component level and the collapse simulations. Great presentations were done on the part one and two. They covered all uh, aspects for the columns, slab column connections, shear walls, and joints and great presentations on collapse simulations. So the third step, and uh, what's gonna be part of this, part three of these presentations, is about when we retrofit a building based on AC41, what's gonna be the seismic performance of these retrofitted buildings, and how they fit in, and how they're compared with the new buildings and the existing buildings. No need to say these uh, existing buildings have a high risk of collapse, and in order to de uh, decrease this risk of collapse, we have to retrofit them. But in order to make a decision on the most appropriate and most economical, based on the different options that we have to retrofit a building, we can do that based on the risk of collapse. And the main thing that we're trying to do is to see, there's an assumption out there that if you retrofit a building, the seismic performance and the collapse performance is gonna be very similar to a new building. And we actually wanted to assess this big assumption. And that's, that was the main purpose of this study. Uh, a recent study by Dr. Lael shows that um, if you have an existing building, uh, the black one, and if you have a new building in the blue one, and if you do different retrofitting techniques, they all fit in between. What these uh, retrofitting techniques are done, they're not based on AC41, but what they show here is that these are, uh, they don't have the same robustness of a new building, and they're more fragile, and that's why we have to use these fragility curves, these probably collapse to see where they fit into. And um, our study is gonna be, take the same procedure, but to retrofit them based on uh, AC41 standard. Uh, this is actually a part of a bigger project. The project was to see the collapse release of these existing buildings. It's a very complex behavior, and therefore, we need very detailed models. Uh, our focus was on mo moment frames, and the main components of these moment frames are the column model, the joint model, and for the slab columns, it's the slab column connection. When you have those detailed models, then you have to come up with the robust collapse model. And with anything else, you have to verify that. And that's when you can have, the, uh, you can come up with the collapse probabilities. And using those prob uh, collapse probabilities, what we can do here is we can assess the collapse risk of these retrofitting buildings. So I will first start with what were the detailed models that we use and how, can we, uh, and how we can say that we have a pretty good understanding of the probability of collapse. For our column model, it's an extension of the model by Elwood and Maley. Uh, it's, an, it's a fully mechanical model. It's uh, all the different aspects of the model from the shear failure point, which is based on the axial shear flexor interaction model for these flexor shear uh, columns, is based on a mechanical model. After, after a shear failure, the degradation is based on a shear friction model, which is, again, a mechanical. The point of failure, the axial failure, is based on Elvin and Maley, which is a mechanical model. So these three different aspects are shown with an axial spring for the axial failure, horizontal shear spring for the shear behavior, and the flexure model is, lumped, is captured by the beam column element. In addition to that, we, we, um, for these 
beam column frames, we need a good model for our joints. Dr. Lowe's gave a great presentation of the different models that we can do. We used, which she called was the simplest one, the scissors model, which you have, a, uh, you, you present the joint with the scissor model here. The main important thing is the parameters for this model. We used what Dr. Whale uh, Hassan uh, proposed to use. So that's, that's how we capture our joint behavior. In addition to that, if we have a slab column, we have to model the slab column connection. It's based on AC41 and Dr. Kang's model. In addition to the torsional spring, which is an AC41, we added actually an axial spring too. So whenever we have a slab column failure, uh, there, were not, there were not going to be any axial interaction between the slab and the column. So when you have those models, the next step is to come up with a robust collapse model. And uh, for these existing buildings, we all know mostly they're governed by the gravity load collapse. And, and our studies showed about 90% are governed by this, which you have, like a, uh, you have a failure in one of your floors. Uh, when you start retrofitting the building and when you go into the newer buildings, you're going to see much more sites with collapse. What we had to do is we had to add these models uh, in our numerical model. What we did, we did, we did it based on uh, floor level. So what we did is we, ca uh, we captured the capacity at each level and the demand at each floor level. And whenever the capacity goes lower than the demand, we would call that a gravity load collapse. This fluctuation is based on the axial capacity, the degradation of the axial capacity based on drift. And when you, whenever you have an axial failure in one of the columns in that story, you're going to have a permanent loss in your capacity. The same procedure could be done for the slab column frames, which we just ch you check the shear response in your slab columns. This, this is actually uh, modeled in our numerical model. So we capture, we, uh, at each second of our, our model, we capture the, f the capacity and demand on all the floors. And whenever we reach this state, we call that a gravity load collapse. In addition to that, we added side sway collapse in our numerical models. So when we do an incremental dynamic uh, analysis, when you amp up your st structure uh, with your spectral acceleration, for each uh, spectral acceleration, you're going to have an interstory drift. But each of those interstory drifts, uh, similar to the gravity load collapse, there's going to be a there's going to be a ladder capacity at that floor. And when you reach a point after you have uh, you have some degradation in your ladder response, it's going to start to degrade. And whenever you go lower than your capacity at that level, that's when we call it a side sway collapse. Both the gravity load collapse and side sway collapse were implemented in our numerical model, and we actually used open seas. So this is already in open seas. Uh, we had to verify this. So what we did was uh, we chose a shake table test done in Encry, and uh, this was presented by Dr. Elbold. It's a two-story, two-bay frame. And this is our numerical model based on those primary components, and we added the uh, system level collapse as well onto it. And looking at the sequence of failures, we see at about 34th second, we have the first failure in one of the shear col in one of the columns, and then we have a gravity load collapse. If we re remove this gravity load collapse uh, and a little bit higher drift, we're going to have a side sway collapse. And what the test results showed is that the gravity uh, collapse happens about at this stage. So as you can see here, our model does a pretty good job in simulating collapse and capturing this very complex behavior. Now that we have a good model for our collapse, the next step is to come up with collapse probabilities. And we consider two, uh, two series of uncertainty. One is the record-to-record -record variability, which uh, we do the, uh, the normal uh, IDA analysis, which we choose a suit of ground motions. You amplify them, and as when you reach the collapse state, which could be a gravity load collapse or it could be a side sway collapse, uh, you can build a fragility curve. We actually added model uncertainty into it, and when you combine these together, you can come up with collapse probabilities. Looking at this figure, we can see for the dotted uh, gray line, this is only considered record to record variability, and when you add the model uncertainty, you're going to have increase in your standard deviation. Now that we have a good understanding of our model, and we can simulate collapse, and we, we can do, come up with collapse probabilities, now we can, do, we can assess the risk of these retrofitted buildings. In order to do the study, we choose an eight-story building. It's a non-doctile frame. It's a perimeter frame. It's designed by Dr. Lail, uh, it's, uh, and it's designed based on codes pre-1970. We did the standard AC41 type of assessment, 
You choose a target drift, you push your building, and you look at your demands and your components. The sequence of failure in this, in this eight-story building started with yielding in the beams, and it goes and yielding the columns until we reach a state which we have failure in the first and second story shear columns, and it goes until we reach the collapse state, which was gravity, of, gravity load collapse. What we choose, we chose three different retrofitting options to do that. The first one was to retrofit the columns. We added concrete jackets to it, uh, and we retrofitted up to two performance measures. The first one was a collapse prevention, and the second one was life safety. For collapse prevention, for the retrofitting the columns, we had to do the first two stories, and in order to reach the life safety, we had to do the third and fourth story as well. The second retrofitting option we chose was weakening the beams. Uh, in order to do that, we, uh, we cut off the bottom rebars from both ends of the beam, and we had to do the first four stories in order to reach the collapse prevention. And when we, at, when we went up, we would never reach the life safety. So for the weakening of the beams, we could only reach the collapse prevention level. Our third retrofitting option was to add shear walls to it. So we added a shear wall in, in order to reach the collapse prevention, and we had to add a stronger shear wall to reach the life safety performance measure. So our pushover curve based on AC41, uh, the red dotted line shows the existing building. When we retrofitted the columns for the first two stories, we reached the uh, dashed blue line. And uh, what we do is we push it onto the target drift based on AC41. And we start increasing uh, the concrete jacket until our demands go less than the acceptance criteria. And we did that for the life safety as well. And looking at the cr uh, critical component, you can see when you have the existing one, this is our acceptance criteria, this dashed red line, and the solid red line shows the response. It clearly shows that it goes beyond the acceptance criteria. So what we had to do is we had to add that concrete jacketing until this blue line would be less than this acceptance criteria for this dashed blue line. And the same procedure was done for the life safety, which shows in the green line. And because the life safety has a smaller acceptance criteria considered to the class prevention, we had to go there. One assumption that we made was that we only retrofitted the building to go almost uh, uh, the first step that we can go less than the acceptance criteria. So that's how we retrofitted our building. Uh, as you can see, when we, uh, when we retrofit the building, we're delaying the failure, uh, the shear failure in the columns. And, and with that, we're decreasing the demands in our critical components. The same procedure was done with the beams. What we did is, this is the existing building, and when we cut off the re bottom rebars from both ends of the beam, we had a decrease both in our stiffness and our strength dramatically. So we had a decrease in our demand. And when you look at the critical component, the red one again shows the existing column with this as the acceptance criteria. And because we concentrate most of the rotational demands in the beams, we see the demand and the column goes less than the acceptance criteria. And that's what we can call this building has been retrofitted for the class prevention. As I mentioned, we could not go to the life safety. We didn't have anything else to cut off for the beam, so we could only uh, retrofit it up to the collapse prevention level. So again, we have a decrease in our demand because we're concentrating the rotation in the beams, not in the columns. The third technique was retrofitting for the walls. So again, what we do is for the existing building, we add a shear wall. We start increasing this, uh, that shear wall strength until our demands which shows in the blue one, the critical component goes less than the acceptance criteria. Uh, for, the, for the collapse prevention, we didn't have to go for, for a very strong wall, but in order to reach the life safety, we had to go with the wall which had a dramatically higher stiffness and strength. And again, as you can see, this is the acceptance criteria for uh, life safety, and the green one shows for the critical column, clearly we're less than the acceptance criteria. But again, uh, I want to emphasize that our assumption was to go to the, for the first step that we can go less than that acceptance criteria. You, could, uh, you can actually have stronger shoe walls, but you, uh, and you can have str uh, less demand. But we went to the first point less than the acceptance criteria. Again, what we see when we add these shoe walls, we're going to delay the failure in the columns. And with that, we're going to have a decrease in our demand. So with having these three different retrofitting techniques and the two performance measures, and going through with all those collapse simulations and doing all those IDAs, we can come up with the fragility curves. 
The black line on the left shows the uh, fragility curve, which is the probability collapse for a spectral acceleration for the existing building. Uh, the red one on the right shows for the ductile existing building. So for the ductile building, we, we did, uh, again, an eight-story building, but designed for uh, standards uh, for the, based on the 2005, uh, uh, two, uh, 2010 standards. So it represents a ductile building, very similar to the existing, but with the new, with the new code. And all the other lines in between represent the retrofitted buildings for collapse prevention, uh, for columns for CP and LS, for beams for CP, and walls for CP and LS. Uh, in order to make a better comparison, um, as you can see, the periods of these different buildings and the spectral acceleration MCE for these buildings, the red represents for the, exist for the new building, the black the period for the existing building, and based on our retrofit techniques, we can have a wide range of pro uh, period of 1.3 up to 3.3 for when you weaken the beams. And these spectral accelerations are shown with red dots on these fragility curves. And if we normalize our SA uh, T1 with the SA at MC level, we can come up with this, uh, these collapse fragilities, which shows a normalized spectral acceleration. Uh, as, uh, this number of one represents the SA at MC level for all the different curves. Again, we clearly see for the existing buildings, it's on the left, for the ductile building, it's on the right, and almost all the other uh, retrofitted buildings regardless of which performance measure we go into, we, uh, we have, they all fall almost at the same point, except for when we retrofit the building for uh, CP level for the columns. One important thing that we try to see here is the 10% acceptable probability of collapse at MCE, which is based on the FEMA P695. We can see that the ductile building clearly passes that uh, criteria. The existing one doesn't. And the retrofit building almost is at that point, except for the, uh, the retrofit building for uh, columns at the CP level. One important thing that we saw and what we want to see what's the difference between this CP for the columns and the rest is that when you only retrofit the two stories, first and second story in a, uh, in a building, you're going to lump all the failures on the third and fourth failure. Uh, third and fourth story. And that's, uh, that's a very uh, important, uh, 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 there's an important point that we saw in our analysis, and that's something that probably can be implemented in an AC41, which only going for the minimum level would not help. And as you can see, regardless of your uh, performance measure, you're still going to have a difference between your ductile buildings. And looking at the probability collapse in 50, in, uh, 50 years, for the existing building is about 50%, for the new ductile building is about 4%, and all the retrofitting buildings are in between. They still do not reach the ductile, uh, for a ductile level. And, you, and as you can see, for the different uh, retrofitting techniques, we're going to have different material consumption. So to conclude on this, first is we had a good model that we can capture collapse. An important uh, point that we saw is that Retrofitting a building will give you an intermediate level of collapse performance. You will never reach, uh, a, uh, if you go based on the AC41 and life safety and class prevention, you will not reach the level of collapse performance of a new building. This was only done for one building. This, is, uh, this, is, uh, this needs a lot of future studies, but it shows that that main assumption made uh, will, is, not, uh, is not always true. The probability of collapse in 50 years uh, drops from 50% into about 7 to 16 percent for the retrofitted buildings, but it never reaches the 4 percent probability collapse for the modern buildings. Another important thing is that uh, our studies showed that adding a shear wall clearly gives a better performance uh, compared to the other retrofitting techniques, and retrofitting the columns with the CP level gives the least beneficial effect. Another important thing is when you retrofit the columns for the CP level, because you're only you're, you're just moving your concentration of your failure to other stories. That's an important thing that has to be studied and has to be looked at. And um, as I, I want to uh, uh, emphasize that the probability of collapse for the existing buildings, uh, when you retrofit it, goes up to about five times the existing buildings, but it still doesn't reach the uh, level of a new building. With that, I want to thank you and open for any questions.